Sean, we back here again on another fabulous Tuesday for Taking It Back Tuesdays. Tonight, I got a real inspirational cat for y'all. Goes by the name of Tony Two Fingers. And it's just that. Uh, he's going to tap in with us and give us a little bit of insight on what it was like coming up in the D. You know, trying to see the best out of every damn thing. But this man is pure inspiration. He got a new hit single out. We're going to get into it now. His single is called Can You Feel Me? New video and everything. Make sure y'all go run that up for him real quick. Like. But uh, we just going to wait for the man to get in. And uh, we're going to do this. But uh, we're going to keep rocking to this uh, Sunnydale Slim, my folks. Fab at the money. White man's world. Let me know what y'all think about this. Oh, there he is. Blue sky in this white world. I know a few brown guys with a white girl. I know a couple selling ass too. I ain't got to see the door, but she has to. What up, dog? How you doing, family? What's up, West Coast? <laughs> you already know, man. How's it out there in the deep side? Cold to the motherfuckers. That's the only way I can explain it right now. It's cold, but you know, we hot over here. We keep the heat on. <laughs> <laughs> only way to be. We can be cold as fuck outside, but as long as it's warm up in the crib, we can you. For sure, for sure. I get it. Well, brother, thank you for... Uh, Allow me this time to uh, be honored by you, bro, because uh, your story is amazing. Okay. You know, you, I appreciate the love. Yeah, your story is absolutely amazing, bro. Like, you are an inspiration to all. If, if nobody else has told you that, you, you, you truly, you're truly great in your own skin, bro, because uh, you, you like the definition of what a real man is, because you had to come up, first of all, Detroit. That, 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 that ain't no little bitty soft spot on the planet, bro. <laughs> <laughs> keep it, keep it. Not at all. You, you really got to be about your shit out there in the day. So I get it completely. But, you know, to come up the way you had to and then be actually curve off into the music game. I applaud you for that, bro. bro I really do. So let's, uh, let's play and get into this. Okay. First of all, we told you two fingers from Detroit. Welcome to... Taking it back Tuesdays here on Hype Dash Radio. I appreciate you. Salute to my man Jeff from BT Media Group. He just tapped in. Uh, bro, when did you want to start doing music? <laughs> Actually, um, my family is musical, man. But I guess for myself, I, I would say <laughs> growing up listening to Run DMC, Fat Boys, Rest in peace, Prince Marky D, too. You know what I'm saying? Um, definitely a true pioneer, but just the influence of hip hop and, you know, coming up as a, you know, elementary, junior high, high school student and just developing a skill set. And a guy with some brothers from around the way, one of the, um, you know, with the group, the DBGs and everything like that. And, um, just started doing it. I mean, you start like in school, you know, you start writing rhymes and you write, you're just trying to get popular in high school and school and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And can you, am I still there? I got you now. The D, the D is glitching. Uh oh. <laughs> no, my, no, my Wi Fi is A1, baby. <laughs> I'll take that. Um, Mine might be A1.5, but you know, we all right. That's all good. Shouts out to the West Coast. The Bay Area got love for self. Um, but just answering your question, I think um, I started wanting to do music professionally once uh, one of the members of my group who started the group, DBGs, uh, Riddler, shouts out to Riddler and um, the other, other member of the DBGs, Sniper, um, I seen him come out with a record, you know, and this is a guy that I grew up with. So, you know, you you have an ideology of people making records. And then when you see somebody that you know personally, you go into the record store. You know, a lot of people don't know what that is. That's old school. You go into the record record store and you see somebody that you know personally got a record on a show. You're like, dang, this is possible. I could do this. 
So I started from that point starting to take it serious. And once I got on that destination of wanting to do music, I just didn't let it shake my mind and shake my desires. It just kept going after it. And, you know, the story is interesting on how it came about, but um, I'm going to let you do your, you do your thing. I don't want to <laughs> ramble. Because, uh, like I said, you 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 are a real inspiration, man. Like, you you really the poster child for nothing can really stop you until you let it stop you. For sure. Uh, uh, I used to, I used to, I used to uh, joke with my cousin. Um, we had this thing about give me back my excuses. Because every time I come around, everybody got to gotta, gotta get rid of their excuses. You know what I'm saying? So I wasn't always loved to show up, you know, because here, here this dude with two fingers coming again, show, showing me what I should be doing and outdoing us and everything. So, I mean, it is what it is. I mean, they love to hate you and they hate to love you. It is what it is. It is what it is. So let's go ahead and get into the touch of the situation because a lot of cats really don't want to talk about it. They're going to be a little sensitive, but you've probably been dealing with it. Well, been dealing with it all your life, so... Kind of numb to because, I mean, Tony Two Fingers. Yeah. All right. Yeah. You've had to deal with a lot of bullshit. So, has it always been like, like a mission to like, I have to prove everybody and they daddy wrong. Um, I don't know if that was my mission to prove nobody wrong. I just had to prove myself right. Okay. Okay. Um. I never was taught that I couldn't do anything, so I didn't I didn't approach situations from a I have to prove it standpoint. I think I did I wanted to do something, I went to do it and either I was successful or if I didn't get it, try, try again. That's just has been my mindset. Um that the journey was never about me proving anything to anybody else. I think that it just kinda it kinda organically happened that way. People might have thought something for, about me and then through my own actions of just being me, they were proven wrong, but it wasn't my motivation to prove them wrong because right. I was too busy trying to prove myself right. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't let the non-factors be a factor. You had to do your own thing. I can't do nothing but respect that, bro. That's, that's big. But, yeah. So, you started with the DBGs. Did I get that right? The DBGs? That's correct. When when did that group start? <laughs> ah, that group started in early nineties. I would say ninety one is when we actually started formulating the group. Okay. okay. Group was actually a, the initial idea for the group was a bunch of groups from Detroit, kind of like a Wu Tang thing, gathering to be a conglomerate of groups, and it was actually going to be called the Detroit Band of Gangsters, a bunch of groups from Detroit and one solid group called BBGs. We tried to shop that to the industry and it wasn't really working. So the person who was the manager and the person who started the group, Riddler, decided to condense it to a, actually it was going to be a four-man group and then one of the members didn't cut. So then it ended up being just three of them, me and my brother and Riddler. Sniper, one of the members in the group is my brother, Sniper. So, um, yeah, that, then we went on about putting together a demo with us three on it. And, you know, did it the old school way, shop the demo. I know people don't know what the hell that is, but uh, <laughs> we sent out. No, they don't. Um, and actually, we weren't the ones sending it out. We had a management and all of that that sent our music to different labels and you know, we we got um, we got a look at Epic Records, but the deal wasn't right. And then I think from the story I heard, Hammer, uh, who had an office in Capitol Records, I think this is the story that I heard. And they were playing um, some of our demo, and I think Hammer heard the music and wanted to know who he was. And one thing led to another. They got in touch with our people, the old school way. You know, it wasn't this before social media, before the internet, I don't think. So, before yeah, I'm a dinosaur, but I still look good. <laughs> Speaking about looking good, bro, because I, I, I looked at your Instagram. 
if you ain't got what is known as the most perfect life ever, I, I don't know. Your Instagram, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't know, go look up this man's Instagram, Tony Two Fingers on the Gram, and just look at how he living. This man is traveling. This man, this man got more Yeezys than Kanye. <laughs> <laughs> you knew I was going to bust you out on that one. Man, you got, oh, yeah. man, got more Yeezys than Ye. But, you know, you're traveling. You got your shoe game tight. We on the new whips. I saw the little twin whips in the driveway with the bows on them. I'm like, this, this motherfucker is really cloudy. Then you, uh, you, you, know, eat, well, you eating good, and then and then all, and then mix up all of that, and mix up all of it. You involve your family, your two sons, your wife. Like, and, wait, I got three, three sons. Three sons, just because it's a little yeah. one. Yeah, three sons and wifey. Y'all always smiling. Y'all always traveling together. It seems like y'all never even leave each other's hip, but you got to because you got a son in, in in college. I got two sons in college. Two sons in college. Say that, bro. What, what yeah, college are they yeah. going to? Uh, my my oldest son is about to graduate from Michigan State University. Um, there's a school, and interesting enough, it's a school in um, Auburn Hills, Michigan, called Oakland University. <laughs> I'm, I'm not, that's, a, that's a little something because I know the you know the Bay thing, but um, yeah, we definitely got yeah, but, Damn. and I also have and I also have a, a older daughter too. She's the oldest. My daughter's the oldest, so I got four. I didn't see I didn't see the little princess on on the ground. Oh yeah, she's she, she my little she my little twin. She 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 my princess. She the oldest, huh? Maybe I was just trolling too fast. Okay. It's all good, you know. I I only put pictures she approved on my page. I'm not she she you know she a diva in her own right, so I let her do it. I let her do her thing. <laughs> Let's get to prove every picture before Daddy posted it. Okay, yeah, Daddy right. can do that. But no, no, you know, but but in all, when it's all said and done, I'm blessed. Um, those are highlights of my life. You know, I think that's what the gram is for. It really I is. keep. I keep the I keep it real. You're not gonna see no downsides. I mean, I mean, yes, there's pain, but you gotta know me to know my pain. I like to show the highlights. It's like at the end of a game, you see the highlight reel. You don't see what homeboy fumbled. You see when he threw the football and got it in the touchdown. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. there's some great highlights, and I'm looking to have many more. But it took a lot of prayer. It take a lot of uh stability and endurance and you know and i got the right background to be able to handle that life you know what i'm saying so now let's talk let's talk about your background because i'm sure it wasn't real easy coming up when you was young did, did you have a hard time were you cool i mean have you always been in the d let's let's ask that one have you always been detroit i've been born and raised in detroit inside the city of detroit not in the suburbs not in the uh southfield and and no problem with none of the suburbs, you know, but it's Detroit love for real. Somebody that's inside the city, you know, a lot. When people come from, I don't even say, I never say I'm from Michigan. I'm always from Detroit. Um, yes. <laughs> yes. But people that live in the outskirts, like you got Floyd Mayweather, who may be from um, where, wherever he's from in Michigan, but nobody's going to know where that's at. So they'll say Detroit. So if you're from Flint, even if you're from Flint, if people don't know where Flint is, they'll say, well, you know, Detroit. And they'll say, so yeah, but I'm actually in the city of Detroit, born and raised. Absolutely. Now, if I remember correctly, the block was Davidson. Davidson. We did it, baby. <laughs> so that had to be rough coming up in Detroit like that because the industry would shut down back then, and you know it's it's always been a hustle and a struggle, as, as what everybody says Detroit is about. But you know, to go from then to now, are you glad you went through them hard times? <laughs> you know, to say, am I glad? I guess based, on, I can look back on it and be thankful that I that I endured it. Okay. It built a certain endurance that I wouldn't have had, I don't think, coming up in a nice, you know, like when I was born, they tried to convince my mother to allow an institution to raise me because she didn't have the resources to 
you know, get me the proper teaching. You know, I wasn't supposed to be able to write, feed myself, or do any other things that quote unquote normal kids were supposed to be able to do. But I had that type of mama that was, you know, about her business. And she didn't know, just like me, she didn't know about I can't. All she knew about is I can. So, uh, big ups and shouts out to my mother. She passed in 2012, but Sorry. she she got she got a real one out of me. Um, and she had five five sons. So, Rest yeah. Of so, because ain't nothing stronger on this planet than moms, bro. I don't care what anybody say. Well, no, I mean I, I ain't leaving on my pops either. He, uh, he passed in 2009. I mean. It was a conglomerate of people that are responsible for who you're looking at today. So my background was hard, but it was accomplishable. Okay, okay. Only because we never understood what we can't do it means. It's always, you know, my mother was a hustler. She was a, <laughs> she was uh, out doing the street life and the drug deals and all of that stuff too. And okay. So. But there were some times of not, you know, looking in the refrigerator and not seeing nothing but some, uh, was it baking soda? <laughs> and, you know, not wanting, you know, wondering where your next meal going to come. Everybody got those stories that come from any type of slums or hoods. Right, right. So, you know, but that's not what I dwelled on. I, you know, I, I went to school. I, I was really smart. My father wanted me to be a lawyer. <laughs> Uh, yeah. 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 So, you know, to his surprise, when I wanted to tell him I wanted to get into the music game, you know, I remember that story. You know, I tell it to everybody, so I guess I could share it with you. I had this thing with my pops, you know, when I graduated from high school, he said, I want you to go to college to do your thing because you, you got that ability. And I told him I wanted to do music. So he said, I'll give you a year. And if nothing don't happen, just go to school. So within that year, that's when the DBGs got on with the record deal. Um, and then I'm just skimming over a lot. There's a lot of background and, and, and in between things that have happened within that. But anyway, the DBGs got a deal. We did our first video. My, I, I'm always calling my father every time I come when we did a video and it's on a countdown. He like that's pretty good, son. But remember to go to school. Now we on tour. We touring all over the over, over the country, and we are doing big stadiums and stuff. And my dad was like, yeah, "That's cool, but go to school, son. You know, just think about school." So ninety four, January ninety four, we on our Arsenio Hall show. Mm. We tear the house down. Uh, we recorded live in, on our scenario, but then it's played on the East Coast three hours later, you know what I'm saying? So I'm calling my house, while, you know, and I'm on the phone while my mom's and everybody is watching me on TV, screaming, and then my mom, was, after everybody calmed down, my mother said, oh, your dad want to talk to me, and I'm like, I'm too hype, I don't want to hear this, <laughs> my father, right I don't want to hear this right now, I already know what he's about to say. So my dad gets on the phone and he says, son, I think you got something in this music thing. And I was like, whoa, that's what I want to hear. I so, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, you know, uh, I guess I went all over the place with how, you know, was it hard, but you know, it's ha everything has its ups and downs. So I'm looking in, you say, dang, this, his life was hard, he was poor, whatever, whatever. But when you, you poor people in the ghetto don't know they're poor because everybody around them is the same way. We just having fun. Yep. But, making, no, making our way out of nowhere. I get it. Yeah. That's big. But uh, so we were forming live on Arsenio. Bro, back in the day, Arsenio Hall was the shit. What was, what was your mind doing? In your head, when you walked into the studio of Arsenio Hall's show and was told, and you realized we're gonna be doing this shit live. Yeah, ain't no, ain't no, ain't no takes, and let's do it over again. Whatever happens, happens. Um, 
that's where um, I, I think growing up musically up under the Hammer regime, we learn work ethics. We learn how to rehearse. We knew who we were supposed to be. Once you rehearse and you practice and you do your thing, it's like second nature. Uh, I know I'm supposed to be on this side of the stage during this part of the song, and I know what we're supposed to do when the chorus comes. So it's like, and, you know, plus we've been touring all over the country anyway. So it was just another show for us. It just happened to be on TV in front of 33 million people. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, <laughs> that many people, yeah, a little bit of people. Yeah. <laughs> but, but what's crazy right. is because you're speaking about it. Under the Hammer regime, you learn to practice your craft. A lot of these cats yeah. don't do that. They think it's just cool to be on the stage and, you know, just rocking the mic. Now, what I can't stand, I absolutely fucking hate, is for an artist to get on the stage with a microphone and rap over his own lyrics. That is the most yeah. professional thing to me. Like, have your show that with your music and know your fucking lyrics. Period. Which uh, is it's a flip. The practice, like, I don't understand how young cats don't do that. It's a flip side to that coin. And I mean, I understand that why they do that, because it has been time. I remember Arco Arena. Damn. <laughs> you got <laughs> um, that. Okay. Um, we was doing this. We was on tour with LL Cool J. Um, SWV, a few other guys. Um, and we were opening up. And we were in the middle of our show, and the mics went out. Oh. So now we looking like Boo Boo the Fool in front of all these people because the mics went out. Now, if we had been smart enough back then, maybe we'd have had our lyrics playing. And if our mics went out, they still would have been able to hear it. So it, we was furious. I remember we got off stage. We wanted to tear the backstage up. And LL, man, I got love for that dude. He came and got, you know, calmed us down. It was like, man, this happened to me millions of times. Y'all did a good job. And, you know, got us back on our professional living. But, but so back to your point, I understand why they do that as a backup. Because just in case something happens with the sound of their mic, the lyrics are still going and they can still rap. So that'd be true if they were doing it for that reason. They just let okay. them. They don't want to create a, a show, a show performance slow. But okay, I get it. We we'll play the nice guy. I'm gonna do the nice. And guy. truthfully, and truthfully, they're only lazy because the the environment in hip hop allows them to be. We got social media. If the public was not saying yes to what they were delivering, then they would have to make adjustments. But because it's accepted and people are applauded, it is what it is. They're going to do what they're going to do. But as long as they're getting their money, and get your money and keep it. Diversify your money. Invest. See, I don't just buy Yeezys. I buy some stock in Yeezys, too. But... <laughs> <laughs> you, have, you, have, you have to email me that secret. I need that investment fast. For sure. For sure. So, with the way you came up with the grind and pushing your line and sending your work out and everything, compared to that work ethic to today's work ethic, seeing how this, the internet has made it so much easier, If your work ethic was so hard back then and you apply it now to today's internet and social media platforms, do you see the difference where you just like tripled your value, but you're still pushing hard as, as ever? Um, I don't know. I'm still learning. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm forever a student. I don't, I'm not going to act like I got all the answers. Whatever people are doing today is working for today. And I'm, I would be blessed to find out how to do it so I can cultivate the new stuff that I want to do and put out to the world now. So I'm not going to shit on nobody that's found a way to read the matrix when I wasn't taught how to read it. You know what I'm saying? So I, I don't compare that yesterday with today as much as I say good music is always going to be timeless, which is, um, you know, so big ups to the young people out there that's doing what they're doing to feed their families 
If that's the truth, you know, I, I just think that we need to be educated more on what to do with our money instead of throwing it up in the clubs. But, you know, that's to each his own. Now, did that come with, did that come with, uh, did that little bit of wisdom come with some age? Because, you know, when you was young and, and you know, you touring with LL, you know, I'm sure it was a little bit of, you didn't put everything in the bank account. You had a little bit. Oh, I mean, I was very wasteful, but our wastefulness was a different, you know, it was still giving to other people. I didn't. I was never the one to throw no money up in the club. I don't know who made that idea up. I, but I did have a cousin over here, a, a distant cousin over here, and and my lifestyle did go up a little. You know, I, I spent crazily because I didn't have financial advisors and stuff like that. Okay. So now that I, I think it does come with a little bit of wisdom because. Black people as a whole was never taught economics to the point of understanding how to make money work for them. We've always been taught how to work for money and then spend it. So now that I have been exposing myself on how to let money work for me, share the game. That, you know, that goes into the new project that I'm doing, which I'm not trying to Fast forward the interview. I'm gonna let you. I was gonna go right there because you got a new video out with the new song. Yeah. Uh, and you feel me? And, yeah, yeah. Now, to sit up and listen to that song, it's a lot of like a lot of you in that song. You like put your whole being into that song. Is that how you normally do your music? Like, it, it come, you have to have a certain feel for it or a certain certain something voice in your soul said, "Let's do it this way." Are you talking about the video or the song? Yeah, the video is touch you right here. Well, the video was just a blue. It was blueprinted by the way the song was written. So, and I was, shout out to Budang because that's the director of the video who um would allow me to guide him in the way that I wanted the video to be seen. So. Um, yeah, I put my all into anything that I'm doing or else I'm wasting my time. You either going to make it count or you ain't going to count. Right. So we got this new project. What's the name of this project? This is, is it dropped yet or is it getting ready to drop? Oh, no, it's, it's not going to drop probably until the mid, mid to the end of the year. It's called Fingernopoly. Fingernopoly. Okay. Okay. And Fingernopoly is not just about money, but it's about being responsible with everything that you can monopolize from monopolizing your family life, monopolizing me. Uh, one of the lines I say um, in, in the title track is the the only real way to rep a hood is buying up the property. Damn, we've, been repping, we've been repping neighborhoods and repping blocks for so long, but not having any ownership in those blocks and neighborhoods. So, from from that stand, I look at what's missing in the world, and I try to meet a need. I think people need to understand how to monopolize their own life before somebody does it for them. Thanks. How many tracks so, are going to be on this new project? I haven't decided. I'm not trying to um, do over overkill on over exposure or over you know what it would over information. It's not going to be preachy. I want to be entertaining, but also drop some jewels. If I do 10 tracks, I'll be satisfied, you know, because I got a, I got a uh, method to my delivery of music, and it's, it reminds me of a, of a beautiful lady's dress. Oh. I give, I give you the background on that. Yeah, I need to hear this one. A beautiful lady's dress is supposed to be long enough to cover up the important parts, but short enough to keep their attention. Genius, man. <laughs> Genius. <laughs> I just, damn. I'm going to have to remember to tell people that, because <laughs> that, that, that don't explain how it should be. Damn, I don't know what will. I mean, because, you know, I, you know, you can put, I think, after so many songs, other songs just began to be fillers. And people are filling things because they don't think that they've said enough. 
I'm confident in, in the stuff that I that I say on each record to, that I leave it at that. You know, you could be too over, you could overdo stuff and overdo a project and have 50 million um, features and 2,500 songs because you think, you know, I understand the whole Tupac ideology. You don't have, you race it against time. You want to put as much music out as you possibly can before your demise. But if I die today, can you feel me can, to last for the rest of my legacy of my grandchildren or whatever? Well, I don't have no grandchildren yet, so. <laughs> they ain't college. They paying attention. <laughs> well, we, we hope so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, speaking of features, are there going to be any features on this upcoming album? Absolutely, but it's going to be in-house. You know, I'm working with this this um, conglomerate called uh, Sovereign Kings. Okay. And it's a lot of, it's one of my favorite rappers is one you probably never heard of, Joe Quan the Hooligan. Um, that's my little cousin. Matter of fact, he's definitely going to be featured on the record. But I'm not trying to go out and spend no big budget to get people with big egos to be on something that I know I can do myself. Okay, okay. Um, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to not answer the phone if somebody happens to call, you know. Interestingly enough, when I put out the Can You Feel Me record, I got a call from the big homie Hammer. Okay. And, you know, and he just gave it to me raw. He liked it. He, he felt what I was talking about and not just felt it, but, you know, because I was thinking he was just calling to give me a compliment, and I appreciated that. But when he decided... Not only do I like it, I want to put it on my Twitter page, Twitter platform, and help and retweet it and help it go viral because that's how much I really felt that record. And I was a big so shouts out that big ham, man. I appreciate the love. Uh, he's always been an inspiration and and just his work ethics to get things done. And you know, and we'll see where it goes from there. Um, but. I think even, you know, when I look at myself as a solo artist compared to when I was in the DBGs, it's amazing how I was there, but I really wasn't there because I wasn't in the forefront of the camera. So I was, I was in the mixture of two other guys, Okay. but now to actually get, be able to tell my story and, you know, and show me in my own light, I think it's going to be something that's, Remarkable. I still have the shock factor. People are still like, does he really have two fingers? <laughs> and I mean, like, come on, man. I've been on Arsenio Hall. I've been on Soul Train. I've been on numerous videos. I was in the pumps in the pump video. See, I was there, but I was like, he was there. He was there. It's like you go somewhere. I've seen him before, but I really didn't see him. So now I'm giving him a chance to really see you. Your resume player is tremendous. <laughs> I've been in that video. Hammer calls me all the time. He, man, to stay as humble as you are to have all these gifts given to you is, is just amazing. Like, well, I mean, because we all live under the umbrella of God. I, I'm not lifting up. I'm not. You know, everybody is a man that puts, and a man or a woman that puts on their shoes and their clothes the same way. So. As much as I have the high respect for him, I can still be around him and be a human being around him. And just because they're on my on this feed, shouts out to Special Generation, shouts out to Sweet LD and Oak Town Three Five Seven, shouts out to the whole Hammer family, man. And you know, much love from Detroit, from Detroit to the Bay. We do it all day. Now, I've interviewed Sweet LD. I've interviewed. Special generation. And they all say we were in the army and Hammer was a general because if it was time to move, you gotta move. And move fast. So let's do it more than Yeah. So when you was young coming up in the game and you had MC Hammer literally giving you pointers on everything, at any point, which I doubt. At any point, do you like, man, why does this dude keep yelling us? We know what we're doing. Um, I don't I don't think we had that dynamic with Ham as far as 
our group. See, I, I think that when Hammer's general um, personality came out more so than people who had to work with him on stage. Okay. Um, we were a separate group. Like, I mean, you had uh, you had um, one cause, one effect. You had B and B. I mean, I don't know how Hammer's dynamic was with her doing her thing or one cause, one effect doing their thing. But when it came to the DBGs, uh, we were allowed to do us. You know, we came from Detroit. We we had a different sound. We wasn't trying to be Hammer. You know, we didn't wear the the big Hammer pants. Uh, we wasn't dancing. We was, we was coming from another... Um, the work mindset. We was coming from a street mindset, so and still thankful that he was, you know, out of everything that had been successful in this camp, for him to give us a chance based upon the style of music we was doing and what we were saying. <laughs> I remember him being in the studio hearing one of our songs. Uh, we had a song called Five O, and he's like, "I don't know if that's gonna be able to play, be played anywhere." <laughs> Yeah. But he didn't take it off the album. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. I, yeah, I ain't had that type of dynamic with him. I mean, the only thing that I remember with him is him just trying to assist us in the best way he could. We had um, a, a huge following in the L.A. market. And I remember we were performing at the Forum, but we were radio guests. We wasn't on the um, actual tour at that time we were supposed to be a special guest because bang bang boogie had went no, number one in that area okay. and we got we got to the forum and ham is on on the side doing the mic checks for us making sure our mics is cool Jeez. so that's love you know <laughs> so you know but you know and then we did once we did our show it was over with because you know that's what they came to hear, Bang Bang Boogie. Uh, yeah, let's let's talk about Bang Bang Boogie, bro. <laughs> yeah, that song, that whole that that was a movement in itself. Where did that come from? The the, the song Bang Bang Boogie. Yeah. Um, uh, it was written by Riddler, who was the lead, who was the person who put the group together. So Bang Bang Boogie came from his mindset, I think. It was just a lot of stuff happening during that time with the Rodney King issue and just people dying of senseless gun violence. I mean, we used to it in Detroit, but we would never want to be normalized to anything like that. It's common, but it's not normal. Got it. And so I think he wanted to do something for the mothers, you know, you know, to tell a story, you know, of how how it how it comes across from the parents' point of view of losing their kids for senseless stuff. You know, we were we were predicted not to live past 21, but that wasn't the norm to not live past 21. <laughs> so, I get it. so we wanted to put something out that, you know, shed light on that senselessness. And I think he did a good job of it. I think the video was done well. Um, it was one of those songs that I probably would have been a part of had I not been locked up. Well, I opened up another Pandora's box. <laughs> okay, so let's go ahead and talk about when Tony Two Fingers went to college. Uh, really? Yeah, um, <laughs> I, you know, I'm in my young days. I, you know, it's interesting when we got signed to to Busted Records, Busted Slash Capital. It's not like what people think. There was no big advance, and we didn't get new cars. We got a, 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 a decent record deal to produce a record and to do a video budget. But once we officially signed, we wasn't necessarily straight out in California living it up with everybody else. We were still at home in Detroit. And so I guess I got a little ego. I didn't really have anything to show that I had a record deal. But I... I, you know, but then I still, you know, have my little street influences. So my, my 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 dumb my dumb self said, somebody said, "Hey man, you want to make a quick uh, fifteen racks? Go over to um, you know, overseas real quick. Bring this work back. Boom, boom, boom. 
you're gonna get the money. So me, no fear, not thinking. You know, my my whole family, we we've been doing this. This ain't nothing but a little trip. I'm about to go do this, go get this money, and then I can floss a little bit. Cause you know, I can use this money because I'm all got a record deal. So the money ain't gonna be strange. But anyway, you know, cause we was waiting on our chance to go out to California and start recording our album. And it was like this big waiting period, which really wasn't that long in retrospect. Interestingly enough, I get caught in customs <laughs> and I'm getting locked up. In the day that I get locked up, the next day, the group was called out to California to start recording their record. <laughs> Damn. Talk about timing. So the first like five or six records that was recorded on the Pissed Off album were minus fingers because fingers was locked up during that time. Then I get out on bail and I've been out in, in enough time to do the video Body Like an MF. Our first video, which went number one on all of the little video shows. Uh yeah, so a lot of a lot of the success that I had with the DBGs all that time, that period of time, I'm out on bail. Man. Now, imagine the weight that I got over my head. Like, eventually, I'm going to have to go answer for this stuff that I got myself into. But, you know, it's just like life. I just kept trying to do... So to talk about somebody racing against the clock. If anybody's racing against the clock at that time, I definitely was, but... I couldn't allow myself to worry about it because we had work to do. So I'm thankful for all of the stuff we was able to do. But yeah, yeah, I, I did a little stand, and then actually, he actually had to go back and uh, plead out and do my little time, which I did fed time, which was about two and a half years. So it wasn't cocaine. But I still be here. <laughs> That's two and a half years fed time. <laughs> You yeah, yeah, three yeah. minutes or two and a half. Oh, absolutely. 98%. You got to do it. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, I'm glad we learned our lesson. And we wait oh, okay. till God presents everything to us. Because that was literally God saying, you know what? I told you to act right. Yeah, yeah. So, and that's going to be a lot of things that I'm going to be able to tell about those experiences from a musical perspective in the Fingernopoly album that I'm putting out because one of the things that happened is I get out of jail and then I got a daughter. So like, that's a whole another story, but that's my oldest daughter. So yeah, it's so many layers. I look at my life like an onion. You just keep peeling back. And sometimes you're going to cry when you peel other time, but you're waiting for that great flavor and taste that an onion can bring to a meal. Say that there. You, you got an amazing way of taking on life's little curves and uppercuts and everything, bro. Like, I applaud you. Like, I, like I've been saying, like, you're an inspiration, like, to, to go through the things that you've gone through and still be on this high of trying to teach people how to stay positive in, in your work and, and, and things will come to you instead of being impatient and trying to take the shortcut. Like, You've been through some hard times, bro. Like to be this happy person that we get the highlights on your gram about is a yeah, yeah. Oh, man, I appreciate it, man. Um, yeah, it's a lot of there's a lot of reasons to be frustrated, and frustration exposes itself in so many different ways. So I just try I try to use my therapy to get in the studio and put something down and. And make something happen. Say something that makes sense. Now, speaking about frustration, last year in March, the world got put on restriction. Mm. Put everything on pause. It fucked up a lot of shit for me. What, okay. did, what did the pandemic do for you And as far as what you were trying to do? like, How big of a pause did the pandemic say, okay, you have to put all that shit in the back shelf right now. I'm running the country. Um, it didn't pause anything for me. I'm an entrepreneur. I don't lose a job. Okay. I don't lose a job. I found it was come up to me, to me. I mean, I look at 
how to make money in a, in a, in a tragic situation, you know? Um, now, I've been saying you know, that the pandemic did one thing. It proved to everybody who was really out here hustling. You couldn't just be out taking pictures on somebody else's car. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you weren't working, so you couldn't take that paycheck money and put it next to your head like it was a phone. You couldn't do none of that. You had to be real about your shit. So the pandemic, yeah. was like, it, it, it sorted out the fake for the real. Like, that's what I've been saying. Yeah, I mean, I... I tapped into a business that I always have money to make. Um, I put it like that. As long as it's a female born, I always make money. I, 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 I invested in female uh, personal hygiene products. So it's all good. It comes every month. They're going to need it. So <laughs> uh, once again, genius, bro. <laughs> uh, I, didn't, I didn't come up with it, but I'm, 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 a, part, I'm a part of the... Um, I'm a part of the mission, you know what I'm saying? I joined this mission to help females. I think that, that you know, once I got educated on the poisons that women have been poisoned with from these sanitary napkins in the, in, in the um, stores, and I found a healthier healthier option, I had to jump on it and um, get involved with it. And that that's all, you don't care, because no matter whether it's a pandemic, an earthquake, a tornado, women are going to come on their menstrual and they're going to need something to make them feel comfortable. So you got to diversify your opportunities out here so that no pandemics can slow you down. Okay. Say that. Yeah. Now, do we do studio in the house or do we go to a studio? Um, a studio would not be allowed in my house. My wife ain't going for all of that. <laughs> Uh, we got a big enough house to do it in, but no, I go to some other studio. Um, and yeah, it don't matter where it's at. As long as it got the sound right and the mic is right, I'm going to put it down. And it's a lot easier because I can, you know, I can go. I think I recorded Can You Feel Me in a basement studio. Okay. And then, you, just, you know, you get the right engineers to mix, master, and get it to where... It needs to be for people to for people's listening pleasures, and we put it out. I think that I'm really happy more so that I got more control over what I'm doing. I'm not on deadlines waiting for, you know, under the pressure of a label telling me I got to have something out at this time, and I'm working at my leisure. But I'm not. I'm not giving. You know, my whole life is not just about rap music or music as as a whole. There's so many different layers to what I do that I'm always going to have something to do. <laughs> so, you know, my favorite job of all time is to be a, being a dad. So, um, it's one of the hardest jobs, but it's my favorite. Yeah, because you have to... I, I know when you talk about your family, your sons and your daughter, I know your chest gets a little bit bigger when you describing everything that they're doing and how they come to where they're going and like that's that's got to be great it only it only sticks out because i know what they had to overcome to get there it wasn't easy you know my two older sons that's in college went to one of the top uh, high schools in the country it costs forty four thousand dollars a year for each of them to go there okay. and they both started in ninth grade and graduated at the top of their class at Cranbrook um, High School. And both got accepted into the colleges of their choices, and they grind it, you know. Um, but it's not easy because there's a lot of pressures, you know. The, the, the more obstacles you overcome, the more people expect you to overcome more obstacles easier. Um, it's just like... You make one song called Can You Feel Me? Now they expect that the next song going to be better than Can You Feel Me? So I don't allow other people's expectations to drive my desires. I just get out there and I do what I do and do it to the best of my ability and let all the chips fall where they may. But yeah, I'm proud of each one of my children and their perspective talents, whether it's from an educational point of view or whether it's just from being a contributing person to society.
You know, all of us was born black in this country. <laughs> it's real. So two fingers happens to be the second so-called handicap because the first one, from my perspective, now that I've been a little bit more educated, is the color of my skin was the first handicap, so to speak. So, but I'm an overcomer. That you really and I'm more, are. And I'm more than a conqueror. So there you go. That that you really are, because the the way you think is almost like it's strategic in everything that you do and everything you say. It, it, it's it's crazy, but that's just how you are naturally. Yeah, I mean, it, it took some cultivation. It took some being exposed to people who was, you know, I try to surround myself with brighter minds so that my light can shine that much brighter. Um, so, yeah, the strategy was getting the exposure. You know, I never think that I know it all. I don't want to be a Mr. Know-it-all. I just want to be a Mr. Show-it-all. Say that. Say that. Well, brother... It is a real honor meeting you because I've had you scheduled for it for for a while, a couple weeks now, as far as the interview goes. But you made it hard to find out who you were. It's not. It's not everything you talked about tonight isn't just on the internet. Like you get the good pieces here and there, but the city right. and get the, the spaces filled in with what you're talking about is an absolute honor it, 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 it really it really is like to, to figure out the kind of man that you are and to even to know that you command respect without demanding respect wow so you look at you that's what i'm talking about yeah, so um and i did want to talk about the record can you feel me just to give a synopsis of what the record really is about because people have been asking and I told him I would reveal it on this interview. Say that. Say that thing. <laughs> so, can you feel me? Is actually a prayer, um, as you can see in the video. Um, uh, my this is a time where I was feeling unsure of myself. <laughs> if you could pick those small parts out of the life. So, my question to God is: How do I make it in this world that demands perfection? And if you listen to the song, that's what I say in the lyrics. So everything I say after that is just a conversation between me and God, with the visuals being kind of like the afterthought of what I what, what I believe I'm going through, you know. But I'm not just speaking for myself personally. I'm speaking for people. Like <laughs> I get a lot of flack off of the part of the video where you see the young lady moving me out the way to get my check on the first. <laughs> that was a cold game. <laughs> I saw that. You know, but that that's not really my, that's not my life, but that is somebody else's that I know. But so now, but it's millions of people that go through that. You know, they, this got a female there that's only there because of what they provide financially and not what, what's not about their substance of who they are as a person. So, yeah, but so the, the record itself is a prayer. I'm asking God, can you feel me? Okay, because then the world is just then the world is just the audience to get some to gets to listen along. Now, the video itself is amazing. But when you said you got your finger tattooed on your wrist, oh for sure. Oh, I, remember, I don't know. Yeah. I looked at my hands in there. I'm like, this is the coldest motherfucker ever. <laughs> I was like, oh no, you did. I'm like, go ahead, bro. But it's a it's a cool ass song playing it now. By the way, you will be here on rotation on highgasradio.com forevermore. Anything else you got coming up, please send me. I got it. Because I had to call for this one. So I'm serious about this. But it goes. Like, it's a cool little flow. Oh, appreciate it, man. Um, it's bringing it back to what real hip-hop was, you know. Uh, I don't, much respect to the mama rappers, but... I don't, you know, I want to be made sure that I'm clear on everything that I say. I want people to understand what I'm saying so that I can communicate. That's what communication is. It was a prayer, and you were telling the story, and that's what hip-hop is, was us telling our story. We didn't mumble all that shit. I said, well, you know, <laughs> you don't mumbling, have to 
mumbling is when people are unsure of what to say. They just want, I mean, I, I don't think the mumbling, I think that's intentional because they really want you to pay attention to the beat and the hook. Everything else in between is really irrelevant as far as, and I might be overstepping my boundaries while speaking for other people, but that's just the way that I feel, you know, so. Okay, well, Mr. Tony Two Fingers, brother, I thank you for your time. You have no idea how much I appreciate you. Please, if the people want to go ahead and put you on their features, please let them know how to get a hold of you. Okay, yeah, I'm on, I'm definitely on Instagram at, at Tony Two Fingers. I'm on Twitter at Tony Two the, at the real Tony Two Fingers. It's interesting. It's a lot of people that call themselves Tony Two Fingers that I've I seen on YouTube. I had so to it's all good. It, 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 none of them dudes would want to write in my gloves. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so um, yeah, I'm also on Facebook. You know, but. Just check me out. Keep listening. I got my own YouTube page, which is Tony Two Fingers on YouTube. And just keep listening. Stay tuned. I'm digging in my crates. Some, you know, a lot of these songs that I've just had that I've been sitting on. I'm gonna dust some, you know, dust them up, polish them up a little bit, and, you know, and just bring them out. Um, so I'm gonna give you a sneak preview of the next song that I'm gonna do, just because you gave me this exclusive interview. Look out for the next single. This ain't living. Wow. I'll take that. I'll take that, brother. Brother, thank you very much. I do appreciate you. Like I said, you are in rotation. Matter of fact, after the interview, anybody who is listening right now, make sure you go to hype-radio.com. I'm going to play this song back-to-back for four times once I get off the air. Because this song can <laughs> be heard. So that's hype-radio.com. Tune in, let's go. We're going to help this man get to where he needs to be because he's showing us how to get there. Tony. Appreciate you, bro. Thank you very much, brother. I appreciate you. I will be uh, getting at you about some drops. I'm going to need the famous words and that, that that voice, that strong voice. I'm going need, to need you to say some hype radio things, bro. I'm just saying. <laughs> I got you, my dude. Much love to the day, man. Indeed. Y'all stay up. We love you, bro. Be safe. Yes, sir.